<laughs> Sammy, I, I am I, here, just not on video. I want to share this. Um, when I first coached the women at the Oval, um, I, I learned a valuable lesson. I was telling them what to do and running the deliberate drills all the time. And <clears throat> I don't know, <clears throat> Sammy, in your observation, working in female hockey, <clears throat> is there a propensity for them to want to know why are you doing what, whatever you're doing that doesn't exist with guys hockey? I think you're, you're so right, Wally, that there's a difference in the, but I'll say the it and the ego, um, in that when I coach boys, there is definitely the, okay, well, coach said it, so I'll do it. However, I think that that's starting to change. And I think where we're going in women's hockey too is I find myself too much in the why and that I kind of get lost in it sometimes. And I forget that it should also just be play at some times. And there sometimes doesn't need to be as much of a why. You know, I want to talk about body positioning and you're going to learn this and you need to focus on this and um, this will help because of this. And then you know, I've sort of lost the kids a little bit. So I do find in women's hockey that there is a lot of why, but there almost is sometimes too much now. Um, and there could be more in men's hockey. So, you know, finding that equilibrium, I think, is really important. You know, I've always felt that I, I won't go back to coaching guys, but I might try to work with guys coaching guys and it's just a different kettle of fish relative to understanding. And I really do believe today's generation understands more, wants an explanation, wants a rationale that we didn't have in our day. And uh, it, it's just really critical. So be, be, I just wanted to make a reference to Daryl Belfry because when I looked at your presentation, uh, Richard. I said, this is bang on <clears throat> for <clears throat> minor hockey coaches. Unbelievable. But I believe Richard's uh, that Daryl's taking it to another level of game like and game like to the point where the, the players teach him. He asks them questions. And that. I really has believe, become, I think, the, the norm in the NHL for the teams that are going to continue to succeed. Uh, not that Toronto is going to continue, but uh, I believe that um, the head coach of uh, Florida, he had a 30-second comment on his team, how they had bought in and he doesn't tell them anything. He just opens and closes the door. And literally at that level, to me, what that means is they know what they're doing. They know what's working. They know what they need to do. And they know what to adapt. If they don't, he might suggest. But I I really think that I, I, I get worried because I work at... Um, you know, U13 and U15 levels. <clears throat> and all we want coaches to do is to ask questions and think about why are they doing what they're doing? Is it accomplishing what they want to accomplish? And don't forget the kid, the, the young players or old players. I wouldn't dare tell a professional player what to do without asking him a question. So that's sort of... Uh, how I've evolved as a coach, I'd be frightened to coach in the NHL today. So, Tom, did you have any questions or is there anything to add? Uh, well, not really. I just uh, I agree with what's being said. I just think that uh, the way I go about things is I teach something and then put it into a game situation all the time because uh, you have to be able to do it when someone's trying to get the puck off you. And people have to support you, you know, give you support that you're able to do it. And I also really like running tournaments. 
and every every game in the tournament has a different you know it has a different rule or uh, with little kids all run it with a you know a tennis ball and ring at and uh maybe a hockey ball going at the same time and they rotate so i i don't think that i don't see that happening very much i went to the american league practice yesterday and the game they had was a game with uh, one net on the ringette line, one net on the goal line facing up ice, and three on three, and the two coaches were the jokers. So to go on offense, they had to pass to one of the coaches, and they played that for about, they played it quite a while, and uh, that was the game they had. So, you know, that's just my thoughts on this. Richard, is there anything you could bring in relative to what we've been talking about? Relevant your presentation to coaches. Any anything that has to do with major junior and pro, I'm I'm not touching. That's not my world. So what those guys do and how they do it, I I, I don't really care. Um, my role as a as a coach developer, I guess you could say, um, is to is to is to look for the, the keys to unlock coaches' brains and get them examining why we should be looking at what we're doing differently. And, and funny, you know, this morning I went on the Hockey Eastern Ontario site. I was the coaching director there for most of 30 years. And my successor, a guy named Brian Gillum, has started an online, um, they have a YouTube channel. I highly recommend you go to the YouTube channel. They've had a couple of speakers there they're not Hockey Canada people, surprise, but they're from all over the world. There's Stuart Armstrong, who runs the uh, a, a podcast, is it the Talent Equation podcast. He's uh, he's runs uh, he's involved with Sport England, and um, it's got a different speaker every week. Really, really good content. The very thing that our coaches need to hear that what's going on in the research in the world is leading to a redefinition of what we do in minor hockey. And that, that, in fact, when I did the presentation in April in Oshawa, I put up a, a sheet on the, I do a multimedia presentation. We had the TV and the, the slides and I had paper stuck on the walls. And one of the things I had stuck on the walls was, um, are we redef redefining coaches' roles in practice? And it was a little bit of a rhetorical question to find out what coaches thought. And I remember looking at the audience and going, are, are we redefining what they do? Because as you said at the outset, it used to be we stand in the middle and we were the sage on the stage. And now we have to learn to be the guide on the side and, and uh, point coaches in the, uh, in the right direction. Like when we had, like Sammy Joe was at, came out to, to Whitby Girls back in September, I think it was, to do a goalie clinic. We're trying to entice kids to be goalies there was not one coach on the ice wanted to come out there not one our goalie coach came out carson he came out or the hired goalie coach but not one person came out they all knew about it why would you not want to come on the ice and hear sammy joe you know talk to the girls about you know about goaltending because that message has to go back so there's an aware lack of awareness there's a lack of leadership and i think that the kinds of things that we are all doing, such as this, this uh, talk, the, the Sharks program uh, and, and others of its ilk across the country or my podcast, shameless uh, promotion there. Um, we need that. That's where coaching is going. I wish we had had that 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Richard, there's one thing that <clears throat> I find the problem is time. We seem to have more than others, but I don't think I'm, you know, doing a day job, nine to six kind of thing, and it allows me to think more, ponder more, observe more, and criticize more. True, but, uh, and I recognize the amount of gray hair that is, you know, not you, Sammy, but the, the gray hair that's... Um, you know, among the, the fellas here, but mine's just hidden. Don't worry. Uh, I, okay. I wasn't commenting. <laughs> I know better than that. No. Um, but 
I, I really do think that, um, yes, we have the time to do this, but we have to put pressure on the organizations, the governing bodies to, uh, to pick up the ball. Uh, in the U.S., they're doing it. I mean, back in March, Wally, on the call I was on, I think I had left it at that time. I had to leave early. And you asked Mike Bellini, who's doing a better job of coach, coach development, USA Hockey or Hockey Canada? He was unequivocal. Of course, as an American, he would be, but USA Hockey. So these kinds of things that, that, that I'm throwing out here, um, I think are, are, we, we need to be able to provide this to, to organizations and explain this coach education has changed. Players have changed. Kids have changed. Parents have changed. And we have to be a little bit more uh, in tune with the needs of the current generation in order to make coaching better. There's no player development without coach development. Richard, uh, well, the first thing I thought about when I read your presentation, <clears throat> literally everything I've seen in there in some way, shape or form is a part of Hockey Canada's certification program. <clears throat> But those are eight hour all day modules or two day modules. And they do get into the theoretical to a degree. And it's sort of the that time they give up so they can get certified to coach. It isn't really what you call a, oh, what I'm gonna get on today is, is a opportunity to learn. But I, I think, you know, as much as we can criticize our our branches, and I have a particular affinity for the provincial one here with Barry Midori, and he's right in the middle of being a mentor for Hockey Alberta, and he has mentored U18 and U17 national coaching staffs over the years. So everything we're talking about, he understands, and he's trying to implement it in in, introduce it in some ways, but the the bigger the bureaucracy, the harder it is for the wheel to turn. So, well, that may be, but I mean, I did a two-day conference in, in June in Whitby um, on using some of this content. So it was two days. Uh, it was attended by 30 coaches. It was free. There was no obligation for them to attend. Um, there was a ton of good content, including a couple of presentations on how to develop culture on your team. I had a couple of guys come in to do that. Uh, Jen Wakefield came in and did a short presentation. I did a couple. Dean Holden did four. Um, I contacted the OWHA to get PD points for the 30 coaches who attended. I didn't get a response. Not even a response. Now, I didn't tell the coaches they weren't going to get PD points. I don't know if that was uh, an attraction for them. Nobody asked, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So, you know, all this stuff that we throw around with, you know, looking at the, at the research and what people are doing uh, uh, in other sports and other areas of the world, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a thief, except for maybe banks and, you know, convenience stores and stuff like that. But <clears throat> Sammy, is, is there a, a barrier, uh, a developmental barrier between women and men in hockey, coaches, administrators, leaders, um, that is it, or is this just part of the history and evolution of the game? Well, good question, Wally. I mean, I can talk from both coaching um, you nines, my seven-year-olds, um, and also trying to find this with the Toronto Six. So uh, as you know, we have Geraldine Heaney as our head coach. And so in our budget this year, we put in a line item for professional development. So then I was looking around to see what is kind of available. And most of the um, 
most of the things are you go to the, like it's a weekend conference or, I mean, some of the coaching things are really great. There's an NHL women in coaching. Um, but it's a little bit convoluted how to get into those things. And there isn't, I mean, most of the women in coaching have children and a family of their own. So there are, you know, they're, they're coaching, but they also have, they can't necessarily just take off when um, they aren't coaching because that's their time at home. So what would be ideal is something like this um, that they could do, say, once or twice a week for um, professional development. Um, and I really haven't found that yet. Um, that is a place to have those conversations. Now, we're really fortunate. We have Ted Nolan uh, as part of our ownership group. So um, when he's available, um, he can you know, have conversations with Geraldine. But um, what would be ideal is sort of a Sharks type scenario for women in co coaching that they could kind of come and go as they, uh, you know, found time and um, that kind of thing. So Wally, maybe that's your future uh, endeavor. If you could start something like that for women in coaching, that'd be really great. It doesn't take much time, right? Well, yeah, you have to be doing nothing <laughs> 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 or being like Tom being retired, just staying active in the game. And, and he can select his time. It's mm -hmm. difficult when you work for somebody. Yeah. And you've got a schedule. And that's <laughs> pretty much most of us. Um, now, Rick Puddock's working in a community in Strathmore. I don't know what to what degree. The, he's working with uh, the young ladies and, and the young men. But, you know... He's got a part-time job, but he's still able to come on. And Rick, how much is time a factor for you? Uh, you do give up your time and make this time, but can you talk to a bit about the time factor relative to yourself and the coaches that you're trying to help? Are they too busy? How do you stick handle around the time constraints to communicate with them? Uh, <clears throat> I guess first and foremost, it does take time. You, if you don't put the time in, you're not uh, you're not doing justice to what you're trying to accomplish, nor to yourself, nor to the the groups, the players, the coaches that you're you're working with. Um, yeah, I think time is a is a is an issue for for most coaches, particularly new ones coming in. Uh, guys that are coaching their own kids for the first time. Um, they, they've played the game. They think they know the game. Uh, they think it's a matter of uh, running a few exercises and drawing up line combinations. And the way you go. Um, I'm just trying to look up. I got a call yesterday from one of the fellows I was mentoring. Uh, and I'll just I'll just read it here. If I can find it. He says he was doing a lot of uh, online course uh, on practice preparation. It was pretty good. And I asked him what, what courses he was taking, and he texted back that I just sat with my little brother for his coaching summer co uh, courses. And he says, I've been sneaking in on all his stuff so far, and then here's the catch. Crazy how much work goes on into being a coach. He finally, he's just finally realizing that. And this is a fellow that has been doing this for a number of years. Uh, I first encountered him when his son was six. His son is 16 now. Uh, and he has not been coaching full time, but he's always been one of those that has lots of things to offer. I know this, I did that, blah, 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 blah. And now he's finally getting into it in a, in a in a deeper sense, and he's realizing how much work goes on in being a real coach. Um, I know I look back on mine. I had my own business, so I had time management under my control. I wasn't answering to an employer. I was answering to several hundred customers, but I could juggle that a lot better than I could a single entity that I had to respond to. Um, and I look back now and I still can't figure out how I did all of what I did. And 
uh, you know, my own pat on the back, I guess. But uh, at, at this stage where I am now, when I go out to help the coach, I probably put in four or five hours of mental plus physical preparation to be, make sure I'm on top of my game when I get there. I doubt very much he's putting even a fraction of that. And it's, it's just what I've learned it takes to to do the job properly to, to <coughs> my satisfaction. I don't know if that helps or not at all, but. Yeah. Well, Richard, uh, the time, like I can't believe that we still can do what we do and we have more time to do it than we ever had. And Sammy, when it comes to time, um, how do you do it? Like, <clears throat> you're wearing so many hats as a mother, as a, as a coach, as a, you know, a, a partner in a relationship, managing a hockey team and carrying on your, you know, your business entity. But how do you uh, balance all these facts? And... Um, I'm really thankful any time you're able to join us because you probably have the least time of any of us here. So can you talk a bit about how you juggle time? Well, I think all of you have been through the, the exact same things that I am going through. Um, but I think it takes a really great partner, first off. You know, and I, I think a wo woman in a sport in in the workforce at at any time takes a really great partner. Um, I was very fortunate this year taking on the role as president. It was came at the same time as Billy not playing for a year. So that made a huge difference because he could stay at home. We also live in a city where neither one of our parents live in the city. Um, so that makes childcare kind of difficult. Means that um, my daughter had to come to the rink more often than she probably would have wanted to. But fitting in coaching um, and everything, I mean, I think like you guys all know, you just you just kind of do it. I'm a scheduler and you put every effort to make sure that everything fits in there. And that's why every week I put sh the Sharks call, I block it out on my calendar and nobody else can uh, book in appointments at that time. So um, or meetings. But I think the biggest thing for me to be cognizant of and this year was certainly way busier having a full time job as a professional speaker. Um, and then throwing on top of it the role of the president, it was um, really being conscious to be present wherever I was. And the biggest thing for that for me was to be present with our daughter when she would be home from school or um, with us um, and not thinking about the next thing. It's really easy to kind of get into that mode of, oh, I have to do this or I have to do that, but really being present with the uh, with her and then when I was on the ice with her uh, team or with various different sports or at the playground I mean her favorite thing is the playground was to really be conscious to be there with them and not thinking about that next thing which is uh, not always easy but yeah Wally uh, as you know I'm sure traveling the world and uh, being an elite coach and and raising children it is uh, it becomes a lot but like King McCullough has said before that it just it takes a really good partner in life to be able to adhere to, you know, maybe schedules that are not their own. And uh, I feel very fortunate that I, I've got to have that in Billy and and that he really understands it too, having played at the highest level himself. And um, I made him my accessibility coordinator for the Toronto Six this year. And so that kind of brought him into the staff. Now he was voluntold to do that. So he's a volunteer, but he does get a championship ring at the end. And I think bringing him into the mix too made him feel a sense of pride in what we were doing as well. So um, that certainly helped, but yeah, it's a lot going on Wally, as you mentioned, but we all do it. And I'm sure that each one of you guys, you know, you just, it's not about, necessarily priorities. I think priorities is just one thing. It's about realizing what is really important to you in life and uh, making sure that that gets done along the way as well. So um, I don't know if that answered your question. That's a long winded way. But when somebody like Richard asks to do a goalie camp, um, that you work with that association to make sure it happens. And I, you know, I do, I do work as a professional speaker. So that is kind of my full time job. But I also do 15 pro bono or under $500 events throughout the year so that it is, um, uh, you know, if you don't fit into that year, then I can tell the coaches or the team or whatever that it becomes next year. And that's okay, you know, and um, that everybody 
uh, feels uh, valued and that they don't feel like I'm just dismissing them because I think every child, every team matters and I want them to know that, but I also want to know them to know that there's other things that are you know, going on the time. So Richard was kind enough to work with me and my schedule to fit it in there so that we could fit not only just the one hour there, but the hour and a half drive that it takes me to get to Whitby too, and all of that um, on the day that Billy could be home in the evening so that I could go and spend time with goalies, which is my favorite thing in the whole world. So that was really a fun experience. And uh, he had so many new goalies. Like, what do you say, Richard? You had like 15 new goalies? We had 11 goalies at 10, or was it 13? It was a prime number, I recall that. It was either 11 <laughs> or 13. And um, I think half of them were... Yeah, the majority, were, I would say, were yeah, new. The older ones than, had done it before, but only yeah. like a couple of years. So they were yeah. even pretty new. So that yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's not like Richard and I really even knew each other prior. I mean, we've been in the same circles, but... Um, that's just one thing uh, I would say every week I probably get asked for 10 to 15 different things. So learning to say no to, I think, is really important. Um, and saying no with um, grace and with, um, uh, you know, in a way that is uh, not no forever, but just no for right now. You should know, you should Sammy, know. that one of the reasons, I mean, I'll the obvious reason of having it out there, but one of the reasons was to entice kids to want to be goalies but uh we also we had put forth a I, I put forth a proposal to um uh to have some kind of a like a rebate if you wanted to join you could get x amount off to to be a goalie at age seven eight nine or something and uh, the board couldn't vote on it <laughs> so so yeah we need goalies but we're not going to do anything to really welcome people into it right there is a struggle with goalies at the at the youth level um, because mm. of the insistence to rotate, which I think is great. It's amazing that they all can try it, but it certainly does mean that there isn't the influx of goalies coming in because lots are dissuaded from being full time goalies. Um, so I'm sure you guys are finding that we're finding that out in the West out this way that there just aren't that many goalies. And then kids coming to my hockey school too, to my goalie school in the summer. It's kind of the first time that they've been full-time goalies. Um, so it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next five, 10 years with goalies. But if programs like what you had are not run, then there's not going to be enough goalies to go around. No. So, no. so kudos to you to run that. And I think that the goalies <coughs> are really important. Richard, I got a question talking about goalies. Uh oh, your seat presentation and the, Small area games, any extra thought to paying attention to goalies or are they really just targets? <laughs> well, I mean, very, co very coaching loaded goalie, question, Wally. Yeah, coaching goalies is pretty simple. Stop the puck. Um, I didn't delve into particular positions or including goalies in the presentation, except um, except to to point out that, well, yeah, you have two goalies at this end of the rink, or you have a goalie involved in your game. And I did mention that in our games that you, you know, if it's a two on two across the rink or, you know, ring it to ring at line or however you're doing it, how are you engaging everybody on the team? So the players on the side who are waiting their turn to jump into the play, you have an assistant coach working with them to point out or ask questions, you know, the Socratic approach. Well, when the play went up those boards, what were you looking at? But how do you involve the goalies in those in those games? Does the goalie initiate the breakouts at any time? Once the puck is is frozen by the goaltender, what is the goaltender allowed to do? So I remember throwing that question out there, but they were thrown out more as rhetorical questions for the coaches to to ponder, because you know the ability to play with a puck today for a goaltender is absolutely essential. You know, 15 years ago it wasn't such a big thing. But now they can all handle a puck. I mean, they're all trying to score goals, you know. Um, so getting the kids involved in that, trying to you know, point out to the coaches, so you've got a goalie there. What's the goalie doing? The puck misses the net. What happens next? Does the goalie get a puck beside the net or not? So I didn't get too deep into those weeds because I thought they would, you know, I'd go off on a too long a tangent. 